Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ideal Investor Show, where we bring you interesting guests to talk about how can we actually improve our investments and diversify. And today we have a really great guest with us. His name is Chris Molina, and he got into real estate investing. And what is really cool and what we want to kind of learn is how he could build his business to the level that he has, basically helping other people also join into the real estate investing business and in the real estate selling business. So let's listen to what Chris has to say and enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ideal Investor Show. Here we are again talking about real estate and all kinds of things related to real estate. And we brought in a cool guest today. Chris is his name and he's going to tell us a little bit what he does in the context of real estate. Before we welcome him, I want to tell you, it's always, as you know, a matter of how deep he do you really want to get in? Some people want to be investors. Some people want to just basically suck up information and really be well informed. And some people want to go all out and really do the thing and buying and selling and advertising and all that kind of stuff. So Chris, welcome to the Ideal Investor Show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And I kind of prefaced it a little bit because I researched a little bit what you do and how you do it. So Give us a little bit of the origin story. How did Chris become who he is today? And, and what are you guys actually doing? Yeah, you bet. So it's kind of funny because I come from, I would say, a typical middle class family. My dad is a millwright by trade. My mom has been on welfare for most of my adult, well, for all of my adult life, for most of my life. So I come from a very, uh, I would say, average family. But it was kind of interesting because when I was 19 years old, I moved away from home and started my own life two provinces over. And it wasn't until I met a girl who encouraged me to, I was selling her on a dream. She kind of had her life together and I was still working on getting my life together. And she basically said, why not do it? So she encouraged me to start reading again. And she took me to the bookstore. This is kind of my story. Yeah. And she said, you have to buy a business book before we leave here. And so I bought uh, one of Robert Kiyosaki's books, which got me into understanding real estate as an investment and understanding opportunities and how to get ahead in the business world from scratch, financial literacy, those types of things that they don't teach in school. And um, one of the elements that Robert Kiyosaki talked about was if you want to increase your income multiple times over, one of the best ways to do that is to get involved in a sales related job. Right. Um, I can't remember what job he was involved in selling helicopters or some crazy thing when he started, but it was the investing side that helped propel his career. And so for me, he talked a lot about real estate. And because I didn't really have a fundamental understanding of cars or anything else, and I thought to myself, well, if I'm going to get into sales, what am I going to sell? And I thought, well, I mean, real estate makes sense on the investment side. So I decided to get into real estate sales. And this is my 10th year in real estate now. And, you know, coming from a trades family, definitely not a business family. It was a huge learning curve, learning how to build a network of people, learning how to communicate effectively with other people. And along my personal development journey, I actually signed up for a Dale Carnegie public speaking course, which was definitely a game changer for me. I was a very shy and introverted young man, I guess you could say. And going to that public speaking course definitely changed the way I communicated with other people. I really learned how to do so effectively. And that was kind of the beginning of my real estate career. About my seventh year in, I moved my business over to eXp Realty, which is a relatively new real estate concept. It was definitely new to my local market. I was the first agent to join eXp Realty in my local market. And three years later, we've got over 120 agents in my group now, all over Canada and into the US now as well. So it's been a really great asset being a part of this company. And I always have that conversation about real estate investing. You know, it's a matter of cash flow. And Robert Kiyosaki talks about that all the time. It's cash flow is king. Um, But then of course, you've got your balance sheet as well. And, you know, depending where you're at with your career, where should you invest? right? You always have to have a net profit, of course, but where should you invest? Mm -hmm. Um, Which is kind of what I'm excited to talk about today, especially with right now inflation at all time high. It's the conversation used to be, where do you put your money 
so that you can beat inflation. And real estate was one of those options. And so now I think you have to be a little bit more creative um, in the way that you invest. But of course, real estate is still, I think, a long-term safe place to put it. Yeah, um, but it, it's yeah. it's a changing world, you know. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. Now let's unpack this kind of a little bit step by step because you mentioned a lot of things, and I'm sure our audience is interested in that. The first thing I obviously have to ask is, what was that dream that you were selling? Well, I was basically trying to sell myself. In essence, I was basically saying <laughs> I can be anything I want to be. I've got my whole life ahead of me. I can do whatever I want. And she already had two degrees and owned her own condo, and I was basically renting a room, um, and I. I was working a labor job. I wasn't even a ticketed tradesperson yet. Uh, I had to really sell her on the dream of what I could be. So okay, okay. Well, here we are. Uh, We're married now. We've got two kids. So I was just about out. to say, how did that work yeah. out? But you beat me to it. Okay. Well, then, that's right. Obviously, you were convincing even without having that Carnegie training yet. So okay, very cool. Other things probably played a role too. <laughs> so yeah. Um, now, the other thing is when people say, okay, well, I went into real estate sales, there are obviously a couple of different ways you can be in wholesaling, you can be in flipping, which ultimately you want to have to sell what you renovated, or you can become an agent. So it sounded like that you went the route of agent. Did you join a brokerage or did you just say, I'm going to just start from scratch on my own? Yeah, so I did get into real estate sales on the brokerage side of things. And I was always an entrepreneurial minded. And like I'd mentioned, I didn't have the sales skills when I started, but I definitely had the entrepreneurial mind. So like I said, it was definitely a, a learning curve for me when I got started. But over the course of my career, I have gotten involved in buy and hold real estate, you know, flipping houses. I still work with wholesalers all the time. I have a lot of investors that are clients. And then with where I'm at with my business right now, you know, where I invest is a slightly different strategy, but I do know that long term as you build and grow your net worth, like I said, real estate is one of the safest places to put it, I think. Yeah, I agree with you. And that point that you made earlier about inflation, that is still true, right? I mean, the inflation is not as equally addressed depending on where you are in the cycle. But I mean, obviously, prices have run up significantly even before the authorities, so to speak, wanted to acknowledge that inflation is for real and is going to stay around for a while. And I think we see it now that the interest rates have gone up quite uh, substantially. At least I can speak for Europe and for the US that less and less people who want to be owner occupants qualify. But from an investor perspective, that just takes a little bit away from the competition because it used to be that, you know, you always had to consider that there might be somebody who wants to buy a place just to move in themselves rather than as an investment. Those people that don't qualify oftentimes make great tenants, which drives rents up, right? So inflation or basically increase in prices and real estate, there seems to be, at least to me, over long, long periods of time, a particular relationship. It's just not linear and it's not necessarily time aligned perfectly. But when it comes to, okay, what happens to real estate over time, especially when you take cash flow, like you mentioned, it's probably one of the, the best or one of the better ways to put money into, especially, I mean, from an agent perspective, I'm sure, or a brokerage perspective, you run into this all the time. Most people don't run around saying, I want to buy this place for cash, right? So there's financing. And from an investor's perspective, I always say, well, if you can get somebody to give you 80% of the money and allow you to keep 100% of the profits, that's a pretty sweet deal, right? Especially in inflationary yeah. environments. Now, you said you're working for this new company and you said it has a somewhat unique approach. Can you tell us a little bit what makes it unique? Yeah, so EXP Realty is a, a cloud-based real estate company, you know, similar to Uber or Netflix, you know, possibly in, in, or Airbnb with their approach to, you know, the real estate industry on the brokerage side. We partner with Regis, which is a co-working office space, okay. um, but we don't have any brick and mortar leases. We don't own any brick and mortar like a traditional real estate company would. And so because we have a lot less overhead, we take 50% of our revenues and disperse it back to the agents that help promote and grow the company. And then it's our company is all under one roof. And essentially, instead of having franchise owners in each location, every agent has an equal opportunity to build residual passive income. And then we hire uh, brokers for each jurisdictional location to help support the agents 
um, and they get paid on a transaction fee, sort of a salaried administrative position. So the cool thing about it is I'm not involved in any broker related duties, but as I'd mentioned, I have 120 agents in my group now that are in several other areas all across Canada. And I wouldn't have never been able to do that. At, I don't think at any other company. Um, well, unless and, and you would be in a huge city like Vancouver or Toronto or stuff like that, that is big enough to sustain that large of an agency, basically, I guess. Um, you said that they can get residual income. Normally, that's kind of not really how most people imagine working as an agent, either for a broker or as a broker. The impression most people have, unless you're, you know, like the, the administrative person or so, is that the money basically comes from the sale of the individual property. So is there a different approach that you guys take? Yeah, exactly right. So basically, an agent will pay let's just put a number on it, you know, $20,000 to a real estate company, mm -hmm. um, sometimes less, sometimes more. But with us, because we take half of it, and instead of putting it towards advertising and brick and mortar leases, we give it back to the agents that help promote the company through recruiting. So you can, you can also recruit and build a large leveraged override commission through expanding your influence to other agents. And that's how a lot of real estate companies are built anyways. And it's funny you say, because I live in Saskatoon. There's only like 600 agents in my local market. So it'd be very difficult to build a brokerage or build an organization of this size in the traditional sense. So that was one thing I always found frustrating. The average commission in our market is close to $6,000. Mm. Whereas the average commission in Toronto or Vancouver, because of the average price was 25,000. So you can follow the same sales training system, but earn a significantly lesser income just so it comes where you live. Whereas now I can build organizations in all of these other markets. And in real estate, there's no retirement plan built in. You have to be very diligent with your money, save it up, build up a down payment and buy a house. I mean, sure, you can create a 0% down, create a financing deals. But as an agent, you're exchanging time for money, right? So the, the typical agent, because of the nature of what we do, it's very lump sum based income. Most real estate agents don't save enough in their net profit in order to do so. And so at our company, we have stock option benefits for you to earn equity over the course of your career, doing exactly the same thing here as you would at any other company. And then on top of it, you have an opportunity to build passive income as well. And so to me, that's been a huge advantage is investing into my business through marketing, because I think of it like this, depending on what your goals are, of course, when I'm investing in real estate and buy and hold our local market, at least the prices don't haven't gone up a ton compared to other areas, like other areas have, have doubled sometimes in, in the last couple of few years, right? With inflation, our market hasn't done that. So I think that if you're invested in a buy and hold in a market like ours, when everybody else is going up, well, you're getting eaten alive by inflation. And let's just say a decent return on investment for a traditional buy a house as a buy and hold property with a 20% down, whatever it may be, you're going to make probably 10 to 20% on your money per year. But when the inflation is, I know the inflation's posted around 8% or whatever it is, 9%. But it's like if the gas prices have doubled, you know, over the last couple of few years, grocery prices have almost doubled in the last couple of few years. And some places, real estate prices have close to doubled. It's like, well, how do you look at those statistics year over year, this year versus last year that was already? So it's like, you got to stop and think, well, how can I make more? And then on the smaller scale, of course, you could take $100,000 as an example, invest it into your business that's backed up by your actions. And let's say you put uh, added another staff person or another two staff people to your business. If that costs you $60,000 as an example, you should expect to over time generate an additional 60,000 per year, you would think, you know, or even in advertising, uh, if you put it in the right place, if you put $10,000 in advertising, you should be able to earn an, an additional two commission checks at least, right? So you can earn 100% up to 300% return on your money if you back it by your efforts in your own business. But then of course, once your business starts generating enough income, you still have to put it somewhere. So real estate is still the safest place to put it. So I'm kind of going through that cycle right now, but it hurts to look at the inflation rates and think, and I know this is not, this is temporary, right? So when you look at the long term, I don't think that we're going to see inflation rates as same as what they are right now, especially for the average income earner. Think about it. If you're making the same amount of money and you can purchase 50% of what you could before doing exactly the same job, earning exactly the same amount of money, it's like, man, how do you, this is my funny joke. I, I shop at Safeway is a, a franchise grocery yeah. store here locally. And at Safeway, used to earn air miles, mm -hmm. right? 
where now they changed it because the average consumer's goal was to save up enough air miles to go to the Caribbean. Right. Now you earn scene points. So like the goal of the average person is to earn up enough scene points to go to the movies. It's like, how have things changed with inflation <laughs> over the last few years? It's craziness. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I think you touched on a lot of important points. The thing that I would comment on is if you look at it under the umbrella of the business itself that you're creating and bringing in additional agents in this cloud-based company that can be pretty much anywhere, this is for my terminology and probably for the audience, I would call that business development. And you can obviously try and obviously very successfully scale to pretty large dimensions and replicate the successful approach. Still, it all is basically part of business development. And you mentioned earlier that one of the aspects is you can obviously try to depend on this network of agents that you, for example, have built to be in business and continue to be in business, even if at some point you yourself decide that you don't want to run it on your own anymore. But that's only all the stuff that you can influence yourself. I wouldn't necessarily agree if you buy and hold properties with the purpose as using them as an investment. And this is why the show is also called a path to early retirement. The idea here is that, yes, the appreciation of properties is somewhat unpredictable, is depending on the location and stuff like that. But when we apply our system, we are not really looking how much more valuable does the property actually become over time. We're looking from day one, is it cash flow positive? And if the answer is yes, then it could be a good deal. And we know, just like you said about inflation, yes, sometimes inflation is much more than we have maybe another 10 years where inflation is 1% or 2%. What is unequivocally true is that the value, because it's not just inflation, it's also the value of money, the value of providing space for people to stay keeps relatively going up. But the cost to ultimately have this property that you bought paid off is relatively stable. Your mortgage, interest, principal, insurance, and taxes are relatively stable. And therefore, over time, you will basically build an asset with tenant income and positive cash flow, which then allows you, and I only want to point this out because I think your model is totally sound, but the one thing that is hard to predict, especially over longer periods of time, is will real estate at some point when it comes to buying and selling real estate suffer situations where the size of the network of agents, in your case, for example, is one thing, but if they have a hard time selling, then there is also relatively little money coming in. And one of the things, and I can, again, only talk about the United States right now, especially those agents who oftentimes only sold like one or two properties, but they were pretty high value per year, when less and less people can qualify due to a situation like high interest rates, for example, and they sell nothing, then they don't generate any kind of commissions and stuff like that for a network either. Right. So I personally am a big fan to say, don't try to park your eggs all in the same basket. When you're building a business, you have to invest in business development. And if the business is scaling, like you were describing, Chris, then obviously a successful scaling business makes more money than a straight out residential real estate investment. On the other yeah. hand, there are circumstances that you want to look for. And one thing I can say, and I think I'm not somehow out there on the bleeding edge or something to say, we will not get to a situation where shelter isn't needed. It's ultimately more a matter of how much is it going to cost for people to be able to afford it. Will we always be in times where like your network of 100 agents can sell a predicted amount of property? Probably not because you don't necessarily influence all the variables, right? Like you don't know if the Canadian Central Bank or the Federal Reserve is going to continue interest rates until we are in double digits. I know it sounds crazy, but we it is just as likely as it is not likely. We don't know. Right? We don't know if wages will catch up to this inflation that we have had the last few years and allow people again to actually even qualify. Or what we also don't know, if I just give you one example, because I visited my mom in Spain over the winter, 
and looked a little bit, I guess, you know, when people like you and I go out somewhere, we want to know, how do you guys do it, right? And so I asked, how is financing in Spain? The maximum qualifying level is 35%, right? If somebody in Canada and the US came around and say, okay, we're lowering it from 45, 50% to 35%, huge millions of people would immediately be eliminated from the market. I'm not saying this to say what you do is not a great thing and I'm super happy for you to have this success. But the investing in the property is more, where can I safely with less likely success as far as pure numbers, but with more likely steady as she goes kind of thing, build my retirement. And if everything is perfect, you can probably retire by just having 100, 150 people in your network working. So that's the big thing. And it's not really one versus the other. And, and right. it's just okay. it's just me personally. I'm at a position where I had money parked in, in buy and hold real estate that wasn't performing well enough. So I took the fuel out of that engine and put it here temporarily to speed up to generate uh, more cash so that I can then reinvest it back into real estate as things continue to accumulate. There's seven tiers of income with what we can generate with cash flow at EXP. So for example, as I continue to grow right now, we're at 120 agents, but we're bringing in like anywhere from 10 to 20 agents a month. And I've only personally brought in 18, right? So I have probably eight different leaders in my group now who are continuing to bring in agents. And so, so it has critical mass, right? So once you get to a certain point of momentum, as you'd mentioned, and Robert Kiyosaki talks about this too, where a true business is one where you can remove yourself from and it continues to grow and profit. Um, and operate on its own. But I think what a business is essentially designed to do is to basically create cash flow. That's only one part of the wealth development process, of course. You also need your balance sheet. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm investing in is building cash flow, which is a short-term effort to get that momentum to critical mass to the point where now I don't want to rely wholeheartedly 100% on one company and their future for my financial fortress, so to speak. So as that continues to create significant cash flow, I'm going to have to put it into real estate, the majority of it, I believe. But the interesting thing too is, and Don Campbell talks about this, he says, real estate should be boring. And, yeah. and my, yeah. my father, it is. And my, yeah, my father-in-law is a farmer. Yeah. My father-in-law is a farmer and he says, oh, farming's too slow. And real estate, truth be told, is slow and boring, and it should be. Yeah. So times like right now where inflation is, is is astronomical, even if your properties aren't like in a market where I'm talking about, that, that might be the case, but long-term, you're going to win. But but there's so many different ways to make money in real estate too. So we're talking about the sales and the brokerage side on the business, but as well, it's like, you know, single family buy and hold real estate is probably the most attainable for the average person. Like if you buy a couple of few properties that cash flow really well, you pay them off over the course of your career, be a millionaire, be in a small percentage yeah, of people absolutely. that become. Yeah. And what I always like is, I mean, when you look at it from the consumer perspective, right, and you're not as sophisticated and, and you may be saying, okay, well, I have my place, but I also heard like Chris and Axel talk about, which I should invest in real estate. The agent, I, I always felt that the agent who has also and can credibly say, here is what I've done myself as investing in real estate. And now I'm or you come along and say, okay, I like this particular location. Tell me what kind of offers you can make, but look at it through the lens of an investor. And that person is an investor, him or herself. It makes a ton of difference. I've at least yes. had the experience many times that a regular agent who is mainly working for owner occupants, people who want to buy for moving in themselves, they don't necessarily see the inside of the property. They point out stuff. You know, look at these nice, plush, thick carpets. When Imagine when you get up in the morning and I'm as an investor saying, rip that crap out. It's just going to have to be replaced every few years. I just a little bit of a drastic example. So I love when people who are in the profession as wholesaling or direct selling or the agents or brokers, they have also some investments themselves because they can just understand what an investor is looking for. Now, one thing when I saw that you're going to come on the show, I wanted to ask you and tell me if I have the completely wrong perception on this, but I was imagining that in, let's say, 2019, 20, maybe even into 21, 
when anywhere you look, prices are increasing and people know that there's a commission to be made, I would think it's rather easy or easier maybe to find people who say, you know what, I'm sick and tired of what I'm doing. I, I want to do what these agents do and get these hundreds of thousands of dollars of commission and stuff. Now, I think everybody would agree in North America, the market has turned a little bit, not that people wouldn't be interested in real estate at all anymore, but they, everybody, I believe, is inundated by the media that say, okay, the market is crashing and nobody buys houses and mortgages are extremely expensive, blah, blah. How is this for you now, now that the situation has changed as far as, you know, getting people on board and basically getting them into your system? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Yes. As a matter of fact, I think that this market is advantageous for agents that know what they're doing. And I think likewise for people that build their business on fundamentals, if you just keep in touch with the people you know, you're going to do X number of transactions every single year. It's the fundamentals. And I agree with what you're saying. When the market's really good, anybody can sell a house, right? You could sell your house for sale by owner. Yeah, um, when right. the market changes, yeah. you know, it's a different story. And so that's where it comes back to your ability to communicate with people, to be consistently having conversations with the people that you know, to brand yourself as a go-to professional person, to add value to the people's lives that of those people that know, like, and trust you. And I really look forward to a, a slow market or a down market because the value of a good agent is that much more than it is yeah. in a hot market. Now, yes, there are agents that, that leave the business, but I also think there's a lot of agents that had success but because they didn't look at their business like a real business is very common for real estate people. They might be looking for a change. And for you know a company that I think has a wave for the future, you know I think the odds are in our favor. And on top of that, uh, I agree with what you're saying too. Not only do most real estate agents not look at their business like a real business, they also don't see real estate through the lens that an investor would, which I also think is important if you want to service investors just because if you make $60,000, you know, do it working a nine to five job, and then you get into real estate with that same employee mindset, even if you make 600,000, it's like, if you spend 650,000, you're not, you're not getting any. Oh, money. absolutely. Yeah, you're totally right. Yeah. And that's also why, you know, it sounds to me a little bit that this terminology that has been so common for so long between an agent and a brokerage or the broker. I mean, I know a couple of agents or people who were working for brokerages and only when when they really changed their mindset in the direction that you were describing, Chris, did they become successful? Because before it was more like, I'm really more an employee of the broker. And it already started with the fact and some were pretty blatant about it to say, I still don't really quite understand why I do 99.5% of the work and the broker gets 50% of the commission. <laughs> so so um, one last thing before we get to the last questions in our interview that we always ask, I wanted to ask for the people that you're looking for that might be in the audience today, is it more likely or are you more looking for people who already have experience and are agents for whatever agency or brokerage to consider maybe doing the work they have been doing, but in a different environment? Or is it mainly suitable for people who have the intent, but haven't really dipped their toe in that much? Or is it both? Can you say a little bit about you it? Know I think that people say 80% of the real estate that will be sold in the next five years is going to be sold by agents that aren't in the business yet. So it's hard to predict oh, okay. who the up and comers are. But yeah. I would say typically that the agent that's well suited for our company are agents that are growth minded. Not everybody's growth minded. And as well, I would say somebody who thinks for themselves, especially if you're in a market where this is a new concept uh, or a different concept. So those are two factors. And then if you have hunger, which you can't teach that, right? I think that that's somewhat parallel to being growth minded, but um, then I think the options are endless. But it's funny because what you're talking about with uh, agents and brokers, it's Robert Kiyosaki used to say, that's why they call them brokers because they're <laughs> broker than me. You know, but I think everybody's broker than him. You know, he's doing well, but. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I think that's a pretty funny, funny joke. Well, I was more thinking about, I know a few people who ultimately, I don't know if I would say they are hungry, but I wonder to 
if an equal extent, a certain level of frustration could be equally motivating because, you know, I know a few who do such a fabulous job and there is obviously a little bit of content. You're working for the same organization, you know, all the ins and outs and stuff like that. But I know the one person I have in mind has many times mentioned that it is not really completely fair that the agent does all the work and is at their openings, uh, open houses and all that kind of stuff and then has to give a very substantial amount of money away. I said that to her several times. I don't understand the issue that you seem to have with thinking like an entrepreneur because a business owner entrepreneur would say, okay, how many of the deals that I'm making after all these years are based on relationships versus the, based on the fact that the brokerage has a certain name on a certain door? Yep. And in her case, I've always said, you know that at least 80% of everything that you sell in a year is because somebody has referred or somebody knows you as buying something that you sold them five years ago to buy something else. How much is really coming from the brokerage? So I think you're very, very right. And it's the same thing for investors, right? I always say if somebody is coming to us and says, I want to become a real estate investor, my first thing is to say, then please also acknowledge that that label, I'm a real estate investor, also means I'm a business owner, right? And you have to get your mindset around, I'm a business owner, I'm growing my business. Business and there are certain things, certain professional things, certain legal things, and certain structural things that any business, if you started a, a, any other business, you would have to put in place and you should put them in place for your investing as well. So I think we're very well aligned and I find it awesome that you basically, in a sense, even though it's not really in, the, in what we would like, it's basically entrepreneurial employment options. Right, because you're offering people the opportunity to do something in a field that they might be interested in in a slightly different way. And so I congratulate you and hope there are more than one Chris out there doing that. <laughs> so, well, you think of it, we teach our clients to invest in real estate so you can build equity and passive income. Right. Um, but as agents, we go and we rent our career from a traditional franchise company. And so we solve that problem for agents, which is pretty cool. So. Yeah, and I'm sure every time somebody actually has the first few sales and comes to you and say, hey, Chris, I can't believe it, it really works. That is very gratifying. It's same for me when I mentor a client and they do their first purchase and it, it's, it's a really impactful moment. So the two questions I always ask at the end is, if you could meet anybody past and present, who would it be and why? Oh, man, that's a good one. I think it'd be pretty cool to sit down and have a conversation with Elon Musk. You know, he's a, a pretty unique individual, definitely making a difference in the world. Whether right. you like him or you don't like him, I think he's definitely changing things. I guess that'd be my answer. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I actually, <laughs> I agree with you. I would love to have that sit down with him as well. The reason I'm, I'm itching a little bit is this whole thing about like him or not like him. I would like to rephrase that for myself to say if you believe what you're being told or not believe what you're being told, right? Because we're all way too yes. far away. That would be the super big motivation for me. I would want to make up my own mind if I like it or not, not what other people say or what the media tries to. 100%. You know. Okay, so the, the other question is, and I don't know if you been into sci-fi and star trek and stuff like that but uh, the last question we always ask is if you had a time machine you know what you know not allowed to change the time space continuum but you can go anywhere forward backward wherever you want where would you go and buy oh man you know people say i wish i knew what i know now when i was younger mm -hmm. and there are times where it'd be like man if i was back in my early 20s again with the knowledge i have now uh, it would be a, a different and better life today um, not that things aren't aren't going well, they are going well. But I think if I really am grateful for where I am, I, I think I would just have to just continue with the way things are. Uh, I would like to be able to say, man, it'd be cool to be 20 again. But there's so much uncertainty there too, you know, and, and with where I'm now, I've got my family and everything. So to be as grateful as possible, I think that we need to live in the moment. But again, going into the future, man, it'd be really cool to see where things are going to be. But But here's an interesting one. If you were to go back to the early 90s or the 80s and take your smartphone with you and tell people from that era, this is what a smartphone is, this is what a smartphone does, people would look at you like you're absolutely crazy. You yeah, know, so well, I think how far it, it's come. Yeah, they would either that or they would say Star Trek is real. Because I mean, if you I don't know if you are a fan of Star Trek, but if you look at the TV episodes, 
and you look somebody at somebody today going to the gym, they're basically strapping their smartphone to their arm or to their wrist so that they can run on the treadmill and stuff like that. That's literally what Spock did in hundreds of episodes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if you were to show up with, with your wrist thing, with your phone on it, and you would look, oh, okay, what's the weather? And let me see if this person, what's on YouTube? <laughs> Yeah. Well, remember the Jetsons and, and Jetsons yeah. is an old cartoon. They had uh, video calls. It's like, yeah. oh, that's a bizarre thing. And now it's every day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know? Exactly. Yeah. So no, absolutely. That, that would be definitely blowing people's mind. That's for sure. All right, Chris. So if somebody says, okay, well, you know, my employer has just announced that I'm going to be fired or maybe that thousands of people are going to be fired. I don't know if I'm in, involved. And I don't want to wait for this. I think what Chris is doing is cool. And I've always been in some way interested in real estate. How can they get in touch with you to find out a little more? Yeah, for sure. Well, uh, follow me on Instagram or, or check out my YouTube channel if you want to learn what I'm all about. And I'd be happy to chat with you, Messenger, on Instagram or on Facebook. And by all means, be happy to, to talk to you about anything real estate related. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you, Chris, for making the time and being on the show. And I think you're doing a great thing, especially when people are wondering, what could I do? I hope they listen to us if they are in any of those companies that have recently announced that they're going to reduce forces a lot. Because I think, you know, real estate is really a cool place. And the people, I hope you agree that you meet in real estate are typically all really good people. Yes, 100%. All right. Well, then have a good rest of your day. And thanks for coming on the show. You too. And thank you for having me. All right. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for listening. And I hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Ideal Investor Show. More info and the links we mentioned during the show are in the show notes, or you can go to our website at idealwealthgrower.com and sign up for the Apple podcast link. And if you like to talk to me, sign up for a strategy call. Hopefully you want to share what you learned with your network and bring more people in. We are really eager to hear your comments. And until next time, be well, stay safe and ciao.